see you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, it's an important night for Canada as we're on the eve of the federal election and an important week for the Flames and what a difference a week makes. We saw the Calgary Flames uh, have a much better week than the one before, winning three of their four for the week. And Matt, I think uh, we'll dive into each game, but overall thoughts for the week, you got to think this is more what we're expecting this team to look like, isn't it? Yeah, and the one game that they did lose, I found that whole weekend of games to be extremely fascinating, just on how that happened and then how they responded. Well, let's dive into these. We'll get to that one shortly. Let's talk about the first game here at home. The Calgary Flames took on the Philadelphia Flyers, and the Flyers... Um, potentially a little bit jet-lagged, but haven't played as many games as the Flames. They started the season overseas, and this was their first regulation loss as the Flames beat them 3-1, to one, getting goals from Michael Frolik, Andrew Mongepani, both their first of the season, and Elias Lindholm, his fourth. Um, really, I mean, this is pretty much what I expected the Calgary Flames playing against the Flyers. There was... Not a whole lot of Flyers offense here, but I thought the Flames played a good game. They stuck with their system, and they were able to correct a lot of things that we talked about last week. What are your overall thoughts on this one? Well, Brian Elliott uh, played against the Flames in this one, and he has a long record of beating the Flames and playing the Flames very difficult. And even when he was with the Flames, he beat the Flames in that playoff series. So... You know, it, he had a definitely had a good night. He also in has this a, game. a long history of playing crappy on Saldo Mice. Exactly. So, um, but no, he had a really good game on this one. And yeah, I was going to say you I can't blame that, this on Elliot. Yeah, like he was the only reason why this game wasn't a six or seven one game, and uh, the Flames played very well. They pretty much stymied the Flyers at every opportunity, and just ran roughshod over them and the Flyers didn't really get much going at all throughout the contest it was nice to see some guys get going I mean Froelich as we know has been all over the lineup up down I uh, could see him get going could see Andrew Mangiapane get going we've we've talked about the need for some of that secondary scoring and really I mean two of these three goals came from our secondary so it's always good when you can get that secondary going early as well Oh, for sure, and that's what made the Flames so dangerous last year was having guys being able to contribute up and down the lineup. And, like, if Gaudreau's not having a good stretch like he is currently, he's been rather poor lately, um, having the other guys chip in with some offense just helps to take pressure off of that. Whereas, like, before, like, when the Flames had Aginla, if Aginla didn't score, the Flames likely were not going to win. Yeah, no, that's true. And we even saw it stretches last year where, you know, if the top line wasn't kicking in, we weren't getting any secondary. But the more we can get that secondary scoring rolling, as you've mentioned too, the more dangerous this team is going to be. And you talked about that last year where, you know what, if they want to tie up Johnny, at least somebody else can get going. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. um, and this, just to note, this was the first game in three that the Flames won. They lost two uh, two before this, losing to San Jose and Vegas on the road. So good to get another win in the Saddle Dome. Um, I don't have much else to say about this game. How about you? Yeah, they really just needed to bounce back after that really disappointing weekend last week and show that like they basically knew how to competently play hockey. And they did, and they got the two points, and that was what was important. Well, let's move on to the next one. Uh, on October 17th, last Thursday, the Calgary Flames hosted the Detroit Red Wings, and an even better result for the Calgary Flames. Um, Calgary sent the Red sent the Red Wings their third straight loss in this one, as Calgary won 5-1. to one. We got goals from Mangiapane, his second of the year, Lindholm, his fifth of the year, Bennett his first, Ryan his first, and Giordano his second. So the Flames all over the Red Wings in this one. Um, Calgary once again played David Riddick, and on the opposite side of the ice was Jimmy Howard. Um, Matt, I, I would say for me, not much else I can say here, but this looked like the Calgary team we need to see. This is what I was saying at the end of our last show, is that like the teams that we're playing this week are bad, and they just need to walk all over them. And... Detroit is far removed from 
the team that they were, and they're going to be bad for a long time. And, like, outside of their first line with Lark and Mantha and, and the Anathasiu, um, you know, like, they they have really nothing in their organization. And, like, the, it's going to be a long time for Detroit to build up a prospect base. And Iserman will be having a lot of fun dealing with that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, like, the, this team is bad, and they're going to be bad. And the Flames put them away like they should. And, like, this was the expected result, and the Flames just needed to play their game, and they'd get two points, and they did. Yeah, I mean, you were talking about the, you know, the top lines here. I mean, when your top guys are Bertuzzi, Larkin, Mantha, Anthony Siu, and Glenning, it tells you that your forward depth is pretty thin. Yeah, that that's, like, as bad as, like, Monaghan's rookie year, where it was, like, Monaghan and then... Um, Yes. <laughs> it's interesting to see Justin yeah. Ablicator on their fourth line. Like, that's a guy who's really fallen in the depth chart. Yeah, uh, that was a really bad... Him and the Helm contracts were really bad. Yeah. And speaking of Darren Helm, what did you think about that uh, little bit of nastiness in the third period? Um, why, For those that didn't see the game, why don't you let everyone know what you're talking about? Well... Basically, the wet Red Wings in the third period were going after Lindholm for pretty much the entire period until uh, there was a face-off at center ice and Helm slew-footed uh, Lindholm. Then Lindholm went to hit him and Helm cross-checked him in the ribs. Lindholm got annoyed, elbowed him in the face, and then uh, Helm took a two-hander to the back of Lindholm's leg. You know, it was, to me, undisciplined hockey. When I watched it, that's all I thought as well. These guys are, and we see it, right? Teams get down by a lot, and they get undisciplined and frustrated, and to me, it just looked like a team that was getting frustrated. Yeah, and that whole stretch, I have to... I don't really blame Helm for being frustrated by that. I actually place the blame on the referees there, because they should have recognized that, hey, it's 4-1, and... They're starting to get a little chippy. Send them both off for like two minutes for roughing, and you know before it escalated, and instead it escalated and yeah, five minute major game misconduct and an injury that you know left Lindholm out of the game, and he's looked a little sluggish since then. Yeah, I'm hoping he'll bounce back. I'd hate for Darren Helm to be the guy that takes him out. But an interesting note in this game, the Calgary Flames won 52% of the face-offs. That's not something we see a lot from these guys is being the face-off leaders. So nice to see that they could win more than half the face-offs and also going two for five on the PP. Um, again, you know, we've talked a lot in the past about maybe the Flames not converting on those PP chances. And only six minutes in the box. So the Flames played a pretty disciplined game for them. They've spent more time in the box than that in most games this season. Yeah, and that's been a feature with all of the games, uh, except for the LA game, where they've been a lot more disciplined in each of the wins this week, and that's a good thing. Well, and you and I have talked in the past, last year, the year before, about, you know what, the key to winning is staying out of the box. Every time we take more penalties than our opponents, we generally take Yeah, and lose. we're also one of the best five-on-five -five teams in the league, so it's always better if we're even strength or on the power play than the other. Oh, one thing I wanted to mention is... That I find it strange how the Flames were the third best team in the league on faceoffs last season. They didn't change any personnel, and now they're like dead last or somewhere in that neighborhood in the faceoffs. Yeah, 10 games in. I would be curious to see where they were 10 games in yeah, last year. It'll be interesting to see if that rebounds at all. Uh, maybe they're just having a slow start. Like I bet if you take a look at a lot of the teams that were doing well, they're probably struggling because of this new faceoff rule with the offensive team getting to pick their side on the power play i think there's still a lot of teams adjusting to that yeah i could see that you know with because now you gotta kind of have a right hander and a left hander available on every line so i wouldn't be surprised if we um if we start to see some some teams figure that out and get their numbers yeah. up well let's talk about the game i really don't want to talk about but we have to and that's the la kings game the second time this season we played the kings and the second time we've looked terrible doing so uh the calgary flames lost in la on saturday night to the la kings and it was a score of four to one la the only calgary goal coming from michael backland his first of the season to break the shutout 
And uh, I, I thought here, you know, one of the biggest problems for Calgary, same thing we saw when LA was here, way too many penalties in the first period. And it, it took Calgary off their rhythm and it gave LA more chances than they should have had. Um, Calgary really had no high danger chances and they just came out overall looking, especially in the, I thought the first 20 minutes they had some jump of them. In the second 20 minutes, Calgary looked completely the opposite. They just looked beat down and sluggish. And I think that's really where they let the game sink away. Yeah, and this was the game that I was most interested to see in terms of, like, there are certain dates on the calendar that you mark as, like, hmm, what is this team actually made of? And, you know, after getting thoroughly embarrassed in that, first LA Kings game you're figuring oh well this team will have a response and they played even worse and it's like um yeah that you know uh that's clearly not a good thing um and that set up a whole you know like if the Ducks game did not go as it did the next night um, you probably would have been hearing me go on a bit of a rant here for <laughs> an extended portion of time. Would you be telling us we need to hire Daryl Sutter again? No, uh, it, back in, uh, 2009, um, going in the way back machine, uh, the Flames played Chicago one night early in the season, and they were up 5 nothing, and they lost that game. And then the next night, they were in Columbus, and they played very much like this LA Kings game where they were just completely awful and in that uh, like after that game I remember doing a lengthy write up on Calgary Puck basically saying that you know this team lacks any character whatsoever and they should blow it up and uh, you know I ended up being you know like they never did actually make the playoffs again from that point and um they always underachieved from that point and like i was very interested after the la kings game you know because you were embarrassed then you embarrassed yourself again how are you going to respond and you know like sometimes team you know especially because of the fact that la has such a uh, motivation with the whole doughty kachuk thing uh, like, this is their Stanley Cup Finals playing the Calgary Flames, and they're up for this game. Like, every other game, it's like, eh, you're playing a hockey game, who cares? But against Calgary, it's like, that they're not going to make the playoffs. They're, that, their sole goal is to beat Calgary. And Calgary didn't have the level of desperation needed to match what L.A. was throwing at them. And they lost accordingly, but... The fact that they were able to bounce back the next night in the Honda Center, which, you know, at the best of times, like, they're 2-27-5 and, two and five in their last 34 meetings in the Honda Center now. <laughs> it was one in the previous 33. That, you know, that was the encouraging thing that, hey, they screwed up, but they were able to correct the ship right away. And... That's something that previous iterations of the Flames did not have. You know what? Every team, I mean, even if you look at um, last year's Tampa Bay Lightning, which a lot of people look at as sort of a model of a good team, everybody has a bad game, right? And as you mentioned, the Flames came out the next night and looked better. They looked like they were embarrassed by this one. We have two more games against the LA Kings this season, so hopefully we can tighten things up, but... Uh, yeah, you're right. I think L.A. came out looking really to win this one, and I don't know if the Calgary's desperation level was there. Um, another thing I noticed in this game that um, it's it's always a little bit worrisome, especially for a younger goalie, and I say younger by a guy not having a lot of experience. You could tell that David Riddick was quite frustrated here. He took two penalties in one game, and I was surprised they left him in much after that. But we saw Cam Talbot come out and play the third period here, and obviously get no goals against during that time. Um, what did you think about the decision to pull the goalie, and what did you think of Talbot in that for in that third period? I thought Talbot looked excellent, and I thought he looked fairly good in the previous game that he played, and that 
uh, against San Jose and thought that we should have gave him more of an opportunity at that point and was glad that he did make an appearance in the Anaheim game as well. And, I, you know, like, frankly, after the that second penalty, that's pretty much when, like, I, I was kind of expecting the Flames to just pull him right then and there. But Well, we saw Talbot warming up at that point on the bench. Yeah. Yeah, and it is what it is. And Riddick, I think, needs to sit for a bit just to reset himself because I think he was kind of getting over overly emotional in the game and I think that like the the play you know and I'm not blaming the loss on him like like don't get me wrong like I think that he played adequately it's just that the whole team in front of him gave him zero help whatsoever and you know I think that he just got a little angry with how everybody else was playing on the team and that he just needs to collect himself before going back in the net. Well, and this is why I think it's important, as you and I have talked about, to have a seasoned backup, a guy who, you know, has, I don't want to say his emotions in check because we, I don't know if Mike Smith always did last year, but a seasoned backup, a guy who knows the pressures of the league so that if you're a younger backup or you're less experienced, or sorry, your younger starter or your less experienced starter in this case, has those nights where he's ha- you know having trouble coping, which I think we saw there for you know various reasons. You've got a guy you know can go in and do it, and I think that's exactly what we saw with Talbot here. Yeah, and Talbot just was the calming presence both in the third period of this game and in the Anaheim game. And, you know, it's one of those things that young goalies... Like, Riddick has looked fairly decent for most of the season. There's been instances where he's been below average, but every goalie has those games. But he also needs to learn how to emotionally cope with being the starter. And, you know, that sometimes you just need to sit for a bit to reflect on things and then bounce back. And when you get it's your turn again and go go again. Well, let's uh, jump to the next game. You previewed it a little bit already, but let's talk about the game that Talbot did start, and that was the Anaheim Ducks uh, game for the Flames. He was in the net, and the Calgary Flames got a big win in Anaheim, a 2-1 win. This was the uh, first time, or sorry, the the second time in 30 trips to the Honda Center that we've won, um, and the Flames really needed this one here. I thought they looked better in the first six minutes of the game than they did in the entire 60 minutes in L.A. Um, Overall, I thought, again, a good game for the Flames, as we talked about last week, the things that needed to be changed that were changed. We saw it in the Philly game, the Detroit game, and this game. They came out ready to play. They started on time, and they played their game. Um, Interesting to see a goal in this one from Michael Stone, very Al McInnes-esque from the blue line there, his first of the season, and then Michael Backlund getting his second. Um, Matt, overall thoughts on this one? I like mean Shanahan. You know, him cross-checking the guy in front of the net leading to the goal, bowling over, sending one of the other defensemen flying. I'm not boring! Ah. (laughs) Taking lessons off Milan Lucic of Hey, you're big. Go knock somebody's block off. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, Luch showed him how to do it. Yep. And you know the thing that like with Monahan that I've always kind of been frustrated with is that he's a very passive player. And you know some players are just stylistically like that. But if he can incorporate that intensity and uh, level of uh engagement into the game and push forward instead of uh like reacting to plays i think that that'll allow him to take that next step into becoming an elite player in the league and like he's very good with what he does it's just that there's always been a level of passiveness with both him and Gaudreau and i think that if he can be engaged more in the play because, like, I remember back, uh, you know, speaking of Lucic, uh, when Patrice Bergeron came into the league, and he also wasn't overly, overly physical at the start of his career. But as he matured into Boston's top center, he began to incorporate some of that physical 
play, not overly so. Like, I would never say that Bergeron's a banger for by any stretch, but little plays and where he's engaged, and that helped him to take that next le- leap. And seeing that with Monaghan in this Anaheim game, if he can incorporate that on a regular, then, you know, you might be seeing legitimate first-line center, you know, top premier player Monaghan instead of, you know, he'll do as the first line center. Yeah. And it'll be curious to see, like you said, if he can continue that, or if we see a little bit more, maybe mean streak from him. I think there's a lot of guys that we need that from this year. And I think if Monaghan can show us that other dimension, he definitely becomes a lot more useful for the flames. Yeah. And especially cause he's such a big guy as well that, you know, being six, three, two, two, ten, two twenty, like that, he's a big enough guy where if he exerts himself, he can definitely push on some people. And, that would definitely help him moving forward. And another thing that I liked in this game was the excellent play of Cam Talbot. And this is back like last year, like when we were talking about, oh, who should we get? And I was mentioning Cam Talbot. This was why. Um, when he's on, he's one of the premier goalies in the NHL. And like for two seasons there in Edmonton, the first two that he was there, he was literally the only reason why they won games. And, like, it wasn't exceptional play by McDavid. Like, the Oilers were an AHL team with McDavid. If only and, they had the real deal James Neal. Yeah, and now, you know, like, he was, like, that's why he played so much in the first couple seasons with Edmonton, because if they played the backup, they were it was an automatic loss, because the Oilers are bad. And... You know, I was hoping that if we got him and, you know, we, because Calgary actually has an NHL defense core and actual NHL forwards, that uh, he might bounce back. And he certainly looked like the Cam Talbot that we saw when the Oilers made the playoffs that one year or with the Rangers. And if he can bring that more, then I don't know as if uh, Riddick will be the starter this season well matt i was mentioning this to you um before we started recording today but if you look at the game so far there's yet to be a game where i looked at it and maybe you look at it differently but there's yet to be a game i look at and go wow riddick really did a great job tonight riddick has just looked like a sufficient nhl starter i think in all of them but when i look at the the la game and the anaheim game and even the uh the what was it the sharks game that Talbot played in Talbot is noticeable in net. Like, his presence in net is standing out to me. And I think for a guy who's not playing much, to be the goalie that I'm looking at going, wow, he's doing a really good job. I think you're right. It's setting him up to potentially take that starting role from from Riddick. Yeah, the only game that Riddick, I thought, gave a full, like, top-notch, top-notch performance was the shutout win against Vancouver in the home opener. Um, but even then, I think the whole team was on then. Like, it wasn't yeah. you know, like Riddick really stood out. It was the Calgary Flames playing the way they should. And I'm not saying Riddick's been bad. He's just not stand out to me as, wow, this guy's fantastic. Yeah. Like, how would you say? Both of them have looked like above average NHL starters through the first 10 games. Like, except for, like, the Vegas game, Riddick looked bad. And the second LA game was perhaps not his best effort but other than that like both of them have looked better than average for pretty much the entire season yeah i think that talbot to me though like you said every time he's been in net he stood out and i've noticed him doing you know the things that he needs to do to keep the flames in it and even though he has what one one win one loss now I think even that San Jose game, there's a lot of things that he did that... Oh, that game easily could have been a 6 or 7-1 score for the Sharks it, if it wasn't for Talbot standing on his head. Yeah. And, I mean, there, there's pros and cons. I don't want to say that one guy's going to win the, the job 10, 10 games in the season. There's pros and cons to both. I mean, Talbot's not signed next year. Riddick is. I think the team wants to give Riddick every chance they can, but... You know, even if you get a game like L.A. where Riddick's getting frustrated to know that, hey, we can put Cam in, I think, you know, just having that confidence in both guys, like you said last year with Edmonton and, you know, Koskinen, um, 
you know, and not having the confidence. And even look at a lot of the crappy backups we've had over the years. I mean, when, you know, yeah. Kipper was here, it's like if Kipper's not in net, we're probably not winning that night. It's nice to just have that confidence in both guys. Yeah, and, like, you look at, like, when Laurent Brossois was with the Oilers, and he was the backup for Talbot for the first couple of years, and, like, any time that he actually got into the net, it was just an absolute embarrassment. And it, it's not because Brossois is a bad goalie, as he's shown with Winnipeg. He's actually fairly decent. But, it, you know, Edmonton's just that bad. And, you know, like, those two years, the first two years that, Talbot was with the Oilers I actually considered him one of the top three goalies in the NHL and you know last year obviously he struggled but you know you give anybody getting shelled like that every game for 70 games you're gonna start to see <laughs> some like a bad season like he did last year because really there's only so much that one guy can do like really <laughs> well and I, and I think Talbot as most modern goalies you're not looking at them play 65 70 games anymore like I think if we can limit Talbot to 30 40 games I think we're going to get a top performance from most of those games yeah and well you see like with the Oilers they have Dreisaitl and uh, McDavid out there for nearly 30 minutes each game because they have nothing else and it was very much the same with Talbot and that they, they just didn't have another option of, at their avail. And, like, now, uh, like, we do have two quality goaltenders, and you can manage their minutes a lot better. And if both of them are playing at an above-average NHL starters level, like, the Flames are going to be just rolling for most of the season. Because, you know, like, you look at last season, they had one of the two worst starters in the NHL all year in Mike Smith and Riddick was good for some parts of the year and was bad for like after his injury and the team still managed 107 points despite that and so if like we're actually getting competent goaltending for large stretches of the season like the Flames can increase their totals on that just from that alone and neither guy needs to look amazing then. I mean, like you said, this is a good team, a good defensive core. They both need to look serviceable or above average, but you don't need either guy. I mean, if they get that way, great. But right now you don't need either guy to, you know, to stand on his head every night. You just need them to look good enough. Yeah. And like if Talbot plays like he did against Anaheim, like consistently for the rest of the season, then, hey, awesome, you can just package up that President's Trophy and stick it on the shelf right away. You know, but that's not going to happen, necessarily. But, you know, you, he, if he can play at an elite level like that, and Riddick can play serviceable, or if Riddick can take the next step and play at an elite level as well, you know, the Flames are laughing at that point. And we'll talk about it when we look ahead to the next week, but I think one thing that the Calgary Flames have to look at at this point is putting uh, Talbot in more than just the back-to-backs and when will he play for the coming week, and we'll get to that later in the show. Um, before we move off this Anaheim game, though, I just wanted to mention a transaction Then one last thought I had there. Before the game, the Calgary Flames made a transaction. There was some, as we know, some uh, guys who weren't feeling well or a little hurt going into this one if we... Uh, take a look at the official uh, rosters here. The Flames had uh, Andrew Mangiapane and Sam, Be Sam Bennett scratch, so they had to make a call-up. And they recalled Alan Quine from AHL Stockton, but because of the tight salary cap, they had to move Oliver Shillington down to Stockton to facilitate that. Um, he's the only guy who doesn't require waivers, so it made sense to send Shillington down. And I really thought here that the fourth line, and it's not often we say the fourth line looks good, but I thought Quine, Jay, Kowski, and Reeder were a strong part of that Flames game. Yeah, uh, they played fairly decent, and... There wasn't really any complaints in that game from those guys. No, I thought they were a good two-way line. We saw some offense. We saw some defense from them. But uh, I would say that line even more so than the third line, the Lucic ryan Zarnik line, stood out to me in the Anaheim game. Yeah, and I, I actually have to give some props to Austin Zarnik. I thought he had a r rather strong game for him in this one. Rel yeah, I mean, relative to how he usually plays. Yeah, I, I think that the coaching staff likes Zarnik, and we've even seen him moved up to some uh, second-line minutes. 
this past week. So I think that, you know, they want to get Zarnik going. I think they might be putting a little too much faith in Zarnik if you're giving him second line minutes. But, you know, let's see what he's got. And I don't think Zarnik's the kind of guy who's going to hurt us. He just might not help us in those roles. Yeah, well, frankly, the Flames need to like audition basically anybody and everybody. Can you be the second line winger that actually clicks on this line? And just if kinda... it was up to you, he'd even be auditioner defenseman. Yep. Why not throw everybody in there? You know, ha- you know, flame survivor. Who's the best second line winger that we can find? There you go. Um, so interesting sort of salary cap maneuvering there to make that work. But I thought uh, Quine looked good there, and I'm hoping we won't have to keep him up here long because that means somebody's uh, not well. But hopefully the guys will be back in the, the lineup shortly. So looking at that one now, at the end of the week, the Flames now sit fifth in the Western Conference with 11 points. They're right behind Vegas and Anaheim are tied for 12, Edmonton at 15, and Colorado at 15. So uh, looking overall at their at their record, not doing too badly as we talked about in the past. Um, you know, we, we talked about their tough record going into this game and doing a lot better now. They have five wins, four losses, one overtime loss. So still playing better than... Uh, 500 hockey yeah and like at uh the 11 game mark last year the flames were 5-5-1 and and that was after the 9-1 loss to pittsburgh so you know they're basically at the exact same record after 10 games that they were last year and they they've had their struggles like uh, you know and pretty much like they do every year at the start and then they figure it out as they go along and you know you wish that they'd be able to get on the right page earlier than that but you know they're not doing a bad job of things right now as it sits so it they just have to keep it up and uh i just want to like make one additional comment with the goaltenders um this team really hasn't had a a goaltender that they could rely on like if they make a mistake that it's not ending in the back of the net and uh, like you have to go back to kipper where like if you made a mistake you know there was still a good chance that kipper was going to stop that and the flames did make a couple of mistakes in the last night's game uh, against anaheim and Yet Talbot was able to keep the Flames in the game and you know stop the Ducks from tying it or winning it. And I think that if the Flames can feel less pressure on themselves to be perfect, and I think that's uh, what a, a good portion of their problem like even dating back to the Colorado playoff series was that they always had to be perfect otherwise oh crap the pucks in the net and I think that if they can have faith in their goaltender they can take less pressure off of themselves and relax a little more and when the the team seems to be relaxed and comfortable with what they're doing it translates into more W's for us well, I think you see that with most good teams. I mean, in the past, we've had times when I think the defense weren't even comfortable in front of our goaltender. And when everyone can do their job and not have to worry about covering somebody else's job, like a goaltender who, you know, maybe they're not comfortable with, I think you're always going to see a better team. Mm-hmm. So it'll be uh, interesting to see if the goaltending can uh, Can continue the way it has been. Yeah, that it, they can hold on to things and hopefully get more comfortable being a good team and start to like just dictating their play and if a mistake happens where oh a pass was intercepted and there's a two-on-one oh well the goaltender's got a good chance of stopping it and even if he doesn't well we'll get it back and like just having that confidence in everybody on the ice instead of and i oh, think even though you know, Even outside the goaltenders, though, I mean, what a difference a week makes. Three, I would say four of these five games, the Flames have showed up to play. They played better structure um, in the last five games. Like, it, you know, it looked like a a team that is, I don't want to say an elite team in the NHL, but a team that should be winning more games than they're losing. Uh, We saw that with, you know, 
I would say even going back to that San Jose game, we started to see some glimpses of a better t- outing for the Flames. And then, you know, we really saw it in Philadelphia. They showed up to play. They got an early lead and they kept it. We saw it in the Detroit game. They came out early. They dictated the play. They started playing right from the get-go and they won. The LA game will throw away because it was a mess. And the same thing in Anaheim. So I think you're right about the goaltending, but the whole team's just starting to click. And, and you need everyone together. We can't have the goalies, you know, keeping us above water until the team figures out how to play NHL hockey. Yeah, it- but it would be nice for a change to have the team being able to relax a little more on the ice and not, you know, because we see, like, I'm going to use Gaudreau as an example. Like, he has been trying to do way too much this season with, like, he's stick handling it through teams trying to, like, make plays instead of just allowing the play to develop naturally. And,. When he starts to force the issue is when he starts to play poorly. And I think that, like, the whole team, if they can just relax more and not have to be as, like, uptight with everything, like, they, you know, if they make one mistake that the game's over, like, I think that the whole team will be a lot more cohesive and able to actually generate things and like when we see that the especially the first line last season when they were relaxed they were just eviscerating the other teams well i think that goes back to the little depth scoring thing too like i think goudreau's trying to do too much because he's trying to take this team on his back and you know win the games for us and i think once everybody starts clicking he's not gonna have to do that as much Mm -hmm. right but i think he realizes his role on this team and exactly, you know, where he's at and his importance with the team. And I think that, um, you know, he knows that he's probably got to fix this, if you will. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, we saw some depth scoring get going this year uh, or this week, I should say. And, you know, I think if the depth scoring can get going this year better than we saw for a lot of last year, then we can have Goudreau be Goudreau. Yeah. We saw this week that the Flames, as we talked about, had to make a weird transaction of sending Oliver Schillington to Stockton. I doubt he even went to Stockton. He probably just didn't leave his hotel room for the night. It's like, hey, here's... Oh, no, they actually have to... You have to report. Okay. The the only time that you're allowed to not go is uh, the paper transactions on deadline day. They were so close. He probably just drove down there, tagged up, and went home. Yeah, Um, probably. Because they were in what... Yeah, they were in Anaheim at the time, so... It wouldn't take that much, but I mean, it's, it's to me a little bit worrisome that we had to do that. If we take a look at the Calgary Flames right now, they have $151,000 projected cap space, not the worst in the league. Dallas has $800 projected cap space and there's one, two, three, four, five, six teams have zero, but it's, it's worrisome that, you know, we can't even bring up a guy who's not making that much without sending a guy down. And I don't know about you, I'm looking at that going, that's pretty tight. Like, if we have a guy who's even, you know, I mean, Quine played three games in three days because of the call-up. But if we've got a guy who's even just not feeling well, they're probably going to be pressured to play just because of the um, the cap room. And I th- I think that the Flames have got to do something to to fix that. But when I look around the league at how little cap room everybody has, it also makes me wonder, what can we do? Well, that's the problem with the cap not going up as much as it should have, and, like, everybody's in a little bit of a crunch this year, and there's not really much of anything that the Flames can do about it. They just... And, like, if they really wanted to, like, they could long-term IR Valimaki, and, like, that would free up his uh, salary, which I think is, like, $3 million with the bonuses. Um, You know, it's just that they don't want to waste the IR space I guess and they if they need to at some future point they can retroactively put Valimaki on the IR and then they'd get the entire you know from when he was hurt forward which was all seasons worth off but you know there's no real need to do it right now and I think you just kind of let things fly for for now and if it really becomes an issue where 
say four or five guys get hurt, then I think you'll need to put somebody on the IR. Just to kind of demonstrate how tight everyone's cap space is right now, a lot of Flames fans have been saying, oh, we should move Michael Froelich. And, you know, that's the key to it. Michael Froelich is making $4.3 million. There's only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight teams that would have enough cap space to take him on without sending something back our way. So that tells you how tight the, the cap is. The only teams that could take him on would be the Rangers, the Devils, the Kings, the Canadians, the Ducks, the Jets, the Avalanche, the Senators, and the Blue Jackets. Um, and the most cap space available is the Blue Jackets with eight, almost $9 million. So it's it's going to be tough to, for any team to, to make – you know, I think even at the deadline, we're going to see this year some um, some struggles with making some moves that, you know, just dumping salary. Yeah. And I don't see, frankly, like there being any impetus on the Flames part. Because, uh, like, I think that once the it gets towards the trade deadline, it'll be like salary for salary type trades or, you know, like a dump and getting somebody yeah what i think i mean uh, if you look at it right now you'd have to find a team who's got like two million three million available like the nashville predators and trade like a four million dollar contract for a three million dollar contract and just free up a million bucks yeah and like at that point you're just kind of wasting everybody's time so it i think that basically until the we get closer to the trade deadline that things are just going to stand pat and then you know the trades will have the various calculus in them to like x team eats this much percentage of the contract and like that kind of thing in order to get whatever deal done yeah it's just it's like i said a little uh a little concerning to me that the flames have less than you know one one contract's worth but i guess good to know that we're not the only team in that boat yeah, well, I think it, everybody kind of got caught flat-footed with the cap not going up nearly as much, and I, I think that's what led to so much of the waiting game during free agency, like with all the RFAs as well, and why it took until the training camp for basically everybody's RFAs to get signed. It was just because of that. Yeah, no, you're, you're definitely right there. So it's... Uh... Yeah, it's it's worrisome, but it's going to mean and, and I think that of all the guys that I look at who um you know, who I trust to navigate this, Tree has shown he has no problems with the cap and I think he'll find those creative ways to navigate it and now knowing what we know about uh Shillington, maybe that's the reason that he stayed on the roster was just to give him that waiver flexibility. Yeah, probably. You know, you and I talked about should he be up here? Should he be in Stockton? That makes a lot of sense, uh, you know, why they maybe kept him here because he's the only guy that could clear. Were you surprised, though, that Quine was the guy that got recalled in this scenario as opposed to a Dylan Dubé or somebody like that? Uh, not really. Uh, I think that um, if you're doing a short-term recall, you go with the experienced guy. Yeah, I agree. I think Dubé as we've talked about, is better off playing in the AHL this year. If he can come up for a long stint, definitely. But, yeah, take the experienced guy. We also saw Quine looked really good in preseason, so I think this is a bit of a reward for him as well. Yeah, and, like, basically with Dubé, you you want his next recall to be a permanent recall. And it's sort of like with Manjapane, when he got recalled, it was like you're up here for good basically and like he cooked in the ahl for a while and his stock rose and now he's up in the nhl and you know now i think you're on the same path with dube and we just have to wait and see and then when he's ready he'll be up here full time let's hope that's the case and i mean i i don't want to sound negative but i hope it's not anytime soon because that probably means that somebody gets hurt yeah you know like i'm hoping again it probably sounds bad but i'm hoping dubay plays most of the year down in the ahl because to me that means that he's you know he's playing where he should be and nobody got hurt i think the only way dubay gets a full-time job this year is if somebody's hurt i agree you know or or trades made, but again, looking at where we're at cap wise for all these teams, that's not happening. Mm-hmm. 
Well, Matt, I, th- I guess the only other thing to do is to look ahead to the next week of Flames games, unless there's something else you want to talk about. This is the thing I'm looking forward to most, is how they, after winning in the Honda Center, do they let their foot off their gas, or do they steamroll the Washington Capitals? We have three games this week, two at home against Washington and Florida on Tuesday and Thursday. Lots of Tuesday-Thursday games this month, pretty much every Tuesday-Thursday we've played. And then the uh, Saturday game is an important one. I didn't even realize it was coming so quickly, but that's the Heritage Classic where we are the away team against the Winnipeg Jets in Regina at Mosaic Field, and that's an 8 p.m. start time. That's where we will get to see the debut of the Calgary Flames Heritage Classic jerseys, the white retros, which I'm quite excited about. But three games in the docket here. Um, As always, let's predict these, and then I'll ask you some questions about these games as well. So far this season, the Flames do not have a regulation loss at the Dome. Can they continue that against Washington and Florida Tuesday and Thursday, both 7 p.m. start times? Matt, what do you think for your prediction this week? I'm going to say win, win, win. This is the second week in a row you're predicting a sweep. Yeah, and this will be a tougher one because Winnipeg and Washington are better than any of the teams that they faced, but I think that I'm expecting Talbot to start against Washington and against Florida, and I think he might even sweep the week um, in terms of starts. And I think that the team, I think they're going to be wanting to build off that Anaheim game, and like they played very well. And this is a game that I'm very interested to see how they're playing, you know, if they can actually elevate their game to play Washington. And Washington is one of the premier teams in the league, and... Like, this is a big test for them. Can they win this game, basically? And I think that they will. I think that after the how they bounce back against Anaheim, I think they'll carry that forward against the Capitals. Some interesting data here. Um, I've used them in the past, but moneypuck.com, if you've never been there, it's quite a fascinating site. They do a lot of really cool predictions. They have the... I don't, Matt, I don't know if you follow it on Twitter, but the poll bot that tells teams when mathematically they should be pulling their goalie. And they always do a percent chance of winning. It's neat because you can watch it as the game goes on. They give the Flames a 51.9% chance of winning against uh, the Capitals. They give the Flames a 51.9% chance of winning against the um, the Panthers. And they give them a 53.7% chance of winning the Heritage Classic. So you're going to go with all three. I'm going to be yep. a little bit less optimistic here i think they're going to win the two home games washington florida and i think that they will get one point or zero points i'll say zero points in the winnipeg game i think that the flames i I would like for them to sweep their heritage classics they won the last one i wish they could win this one too but i have a feeling that winnipeg is going to be it's sort of like the la game right winnipeg is going to be playing from behind and it's going to be more important to them than it is to calgary um, but it'll it, be a definitely an interesting week of games to to see what this team really is made of and if they can put the foot on the gas pedal and you know take off or is this gonna the waffling between playing good and playing bad going to continue my predictions here i think that as you mentioned talbot's gonna play against washington i agree with that i think that i would put talbot in against washington i think washington's gonna be a game where we're gonna see the traditional calgary flames not come out well in the first period probably uh get one or two goals against them and then have to bear down in the second half and win the game i just think that washington might surprise the flames a little bit in that respect um, I think Florida will be a probably a game more similar to the Philly game where they can come out right away, make an impact, and as long as they keep their foot on the gas, they'll be able to beat Florida. And I'm, I still think Winnipeg. I I, I think Winnipeg is going to have the drive in that outdoor game. Yeah, I don't think Calgary's going to play bad. I just think Winnipeg is going to win it, um, and especially if Talbot's in net, I think that Winnipeg game. They have some good scores, and I think it's going to be more about Calgary scoring more than Winnipeg if they're going to win it if Talbot's in net. I agree. Um, but I could I could definitely see Talbot play Washington and Florida. I don't see him playing against uh, Winnipeg, though. I think the Flames will probably want to put Riddick back in there unless Talbot looks spectacular. 
Yeah. I agree. But it I'm I'm really hoping they get them going in both Washington and Florida. And those games are both uh, 7 o'clock start times. And don't forget that the Heritage Classic is an 8 p.m. start time. That's going to be weird to have an outdoor game at night. Like, yeah. I think the Calgary one was well, like 2 the, o'clock, the, so you could still see what was going on. No, it, no, it was uh, an evening was game. Um, yeah, it was light out during the early part, and then... It got dark and. Oh right, period. they did the uh, they did the alumni game in the afternoon. Yeah. And there's no alumni game this time either that I've seen. Oh really? Th- that'd be bizarre because usually they do have one like on the Friday. Yeah, I haven't I haven't seen this. anything, but um, I, it's something I was really excited about, but I haven't seen a Flames lineup or anything for one. Me. Uh, well, well. Oh. We'll see. Maybe it's because it's not here. I mean, there's so many alumni guys that live in Calgary. I think it was easy to put together, but I think the expense of sending a bunch of alumni from both teams to Winnipeg or to Regina, I mean, maybe isn't worth it. Yeah. I mean, we don't we we'll don't see. generally see these games in neutral sites, right? Usually they're on one NHL team's turf or the others. Yeah. Actually, you're right. I can't remember another outdoor game where it was no, on like usually ground. it's in one city or the other so it's probably easy to get alumni for at least one city there yeah. um well we'll see how the flames do hopefully the uh, the the regina game will be nice uh, weather a uh, way different than probably a february game in calgary which is what we saw last time and if, if you're that was a lot of fun that yeah time. you were there weren't you could you yeah, see that was a lot of fun Oh, yeah, definitely. Because, you know, I wanted the experience, but I wanted to be able to see, so I put the TV next to the window, and I sat on the deck and watched it. I still got to freeze my ass off, but I got a good view. (laughs) Um, If anyone's going to be in Regina, send us some pictures. We'd love to see your pictures. You can tweet them to us or send them on Facebook. And if you want to find us on Facebook, we are facebook.com slash fireside chat. On Twitter, we're uh, at fireside podcast. And as we mentioned last week, we'd love it if you could leave us a review or a rating on wherever you listen to your podcast, Google Podcast, iTunes. Uh, those ratings are going to help us l- get more listeners to listen to Fireside Chat and expose us to more Flames fans. So if you could do that for us, we'd really appreciate it. Matt, I think that's about it for this week. Anything else you want to chat about? Not really. I uh, just a uh, lot of questions remaining with this team on exactly what they're made of, and it'll be interesting to see moving forward how all of the players, frankly, start to sort themselves out for we this have season. These two games at home the, and then there, a five-game road been... trip, and I think by the time they get back from the five-game road trip on uh, November fourth, I think we're going to have a better understanding of who this year's Calgary Flames are. Yeah, because we've seen a lot of upside with a bunch of the players on this team and a lot of iffy play from those same players, so it'll be interesting to see what, which version of those players we're actually getting this year. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think Bill... I know not everyone likes him, but I think Bill Peters is a smart guy. I think that these, these Calgary Flames players are good players, and we saw that last year. I just think that they maybe need to have their butt kicked a little bit about reminding them to get in gear and be consistent. Like you said, we're seeing some good games. We're seeing some okay games, but I think the biggest thing is consistency. We need to see them play the same way every night. Yeah. And we need to see more mean Shanahan. We'll see if that comes out this week. Maybe in the outdoor game, he can put somebody right through the boards in the outside ice. Go into the snow That's drift. Right. <laughs> All right, Matt, well, enjoy watching the election results tonight, and we'll talk to you next week after the Heritage Classic. Thanks for listening, everybody, and as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.